what's up everybody? It's Josh Knapp here. You're watching Collider Heroes. This is episode 56 and we are going to start covering the news of superheroes and supervillains very shortly. I'm going to introduce my star-packed, super uh, action-packed guest we got. The regulars are all here. Starting over here with John Campia. What's up, man? How you doing, guys? Good to be here. Awesome. We got Robert Meyer Burnett right over here. Well, hello, 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 hello. hello. And uh, Amy Dallin right hello. over here. Good to be here. I hope it's not too action-packed because I it's, did not bring my fighting gloves. It's so action-packed. <laughs> We're going to get right into it. Uh, we're going to get right into it. Captain America Civil War opens this week. That's right, Sweaties. You're going to be able to see this incredible action film in the next, like, 80 hours or so. But everyone here on the panel's already seen it, including our very own Robert Meyer Burnett and Amy Dallin. They saw it last night. Let's get their thoughts on it. Non-spoiler thoughts. Robert, what did you think well, about first, Civil thank War? You. Thank you for the uh, getting those tickets. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's my favorite uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. Nice. I, I think it, it resonates with me on a on a political level, on a personal level, on an emotional level. Um, I just I loved everything about the film. I thought the writing was incredible, the action's incredible, and uh, it makes my my hot toys funny bones sweat with anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> Within the first forty eight seconds, he mentioned well, hot I toys. I can't even say what I want a six scale of. Oh yeah, let's not Never talk. Mind. Nothing spoilery. Amy, your thoughts? about Civil War. Well, like you said, thank you so much for like giving us that chance. I, I still have my tickets for Thursday, but I can't wait to see it again. Uh, what a movie. <laughs> like, I, I just, I cannot wait. I'm going to be talking about this with you guys online and with every friend that I have for years, and I love that I will get to have that chance because there's so much to talk about and unpack, and it is really, really quite wonderful. Although, like I was telling you, I, I forgot how much it bums me out to watch my people fight. <laughs> <laughs> like that was because you know in the movie I'm like I'm gonna watch this a million more times and then there are parts where I'm like this this is this is not fun <laughs> but no it was fun it was fun throughout and I'm really excited well awesome well you guys just probably saw there's a new clip that just dropped it's a, a action sequence of Black Panther fighting the Winter Soldier on the rooftop where he's basically getting shot by a helicopter he's just like what's up son vibranium so there's so many amazing moments in this film I cannot wait for all of you to share anything you want to add about Civil War you've already seen it how many times oh, John? Well, I've, I've only seen it twice so far I'm gonna see it a third time this weekend probably a fourth time this weekend Definitely. too it, it's just so freaking spectacular it's just so good from an action point of view it's so well written there's the dramatic elements something you said in a conversation we had earlier was it was so bang on you said this is the most mature actually mm. of all the Marvel Cinematic Universe's uh, films so far and that is not what makes it better than other films it just makes it it adds a new dimension to it it's fantastic it's wonderful cannot wait for you guys to see it yeah definitely Civil War is the superhero film that levels up so definitely check it out opening this weekend May 6th What's not opening for like two years is Ben Affleck's The Batman. But you know what is probably coming up is a whole bunch of cool villains. Uh, so ba Ben Affleck and Jeff Johns have complete creative control over the upcoming feature film, The Batman. I know everyone's telling me it's not called The Batman. Well, I'm calling it The Batman until they come out with an actual official title. It's called The Batman. And a new rumor says there are many villains that are going to keep up, possibly appear in this new film. Let's talk about the rogues gallery for a minute. We've already seen movie versions in the previous Batmans of the Joker, Two-Face, Scarecrow, Bane, Ra's al Ghul, uh, the Riddler, Penguin, and Catwoman in all the Batman films previous to this new incarnation. The only characters that we know for sure are part of this brand new universe, the Batfleck universe, whatever you want to call it, is obviously the Joker played by Jared Leto. We've got Harley Quinn played by Margot Robbie and Killer Croc played by Adewale Anuya Agbahi, I hope I didn't slaughter the name. Possibly Katana, played by Karen Fukuhara, depending how, right. if you want to meld the outsiders and some other characters, we don't know. But who's going to be featured in this first of what will probably be a trilogy of Batman films helmed by Affleck? Uh, he's, Batman's my favorite hero of, uh, of comic books. Like, you know, the group is Fantastic Four, single character is Batman. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speculate first, I'm gonna say, I would love to see the Ben Affleck Batman film with at least three villains and story-wise you can cram it with more but I think you're opening it up I'd like to see a prequel I would like to see him taking out the penguin and in, in some kind of 10 minute action sequence we get the, the you know the credits then we rock right into a prequel that the Joker is not the Joker yet it's still Jared Leto and he's having to deal with 
the Riddler played by Leonardo DiCaprio. So it's like something like that <laughs> would just be enough fun for me where we don't need to go to Arkham and see all these dudes in jail. I would like to see, and that's not overpacking a Batman film. You're already in Arkham. He's already Batman. He's already put some dudes in jail. He's fighting He's fighting this weird rogue gallery as we as we watch the movie. And it's 10 years earlier. So it's, be, it's before the events of Batman v Superman. That is something I'm looking forward to. What are your thoughts, Robert, about a possible Batman rogues gallery? <laughs> well, Batman. since Katana is in the Suicide Squad, maybe they'll go back to the Outsiders and bring us the nuclear family. Mm. <laughs> Come on, man. No, I, I, I'm kidding. That's not going to happen. They're like the worst villains ever. Mm. No, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I was thinking about, look, you, you've already said you want to go back to the classic. There's a reason the classic Batman villains are the classic Batman villains. But I, I, I love Catwoman. I want to see a romance. I really want to see Batman and Catwoman have a full-blown, like we're talking out of Africa, maybe English patient, some kind of real romance in the superhero world. We haven't seen that. Out of Gotham. Out of Gotham. Yeah. Out of Gotham. There you go. I want to see that. <laughs> I, 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 no, I'm serious. I, and, and the fact is, he's got to bring her down. He loves her, but he has to bring her down. Not like the Michelle Pfeiffer business, and which I loved, right. but I want to see a legitimate, like Batman falls in love with the wrong woman. Okay. And how does he deal with that? All right, so you want to see a romantic Batman. I want to see a romantic Batman. All right, John, what do you want to Screw see? Screw that! <laughs> this is the Ben Affleck Batman. Him and Kevin are going to have angry sex. They're going to be like <laughs> fighting on rooftops to go, girl, are you turned on? Yeah! And then they're going to have like angry sex on the rooftop. Could still be romantic. <laughs> it could still be very gentle and romantic. He puts out a candle but um <laughs> i i would there, there are three names i would love to see and then i want to pitch a totally off the wall idea and see what you think yeah. three names I, I would actually really like to see uh you would have to play with his name a little bit i've always thought kg beast would be a really good uh, addition to a batman live action cinematic Supposedly, universe that's kg beast in the Batman. yes that's what we're saying man. so that could be a possibility uh another person uh, we, we talked a little bit off camera but black mask i think is a really interesting thing but i really think you could set up because look, we saw Scarecrow in Nolan's movies, right? But it was a minor character, right. and the, but and Rachel Ghoul was the main one, right? At the point, I think you could have a lot of villains and actually set it up. Joker's got to have a special situation going on because of the Suicide Squad. Already. You could set up where the true baddie, and I really think this would work, especially when you look at the success they had with him on television, is Deathstroke. Mm -hmm. I think Deathstroke would be a really, really interesting dude, especially the personification of who he is against who this Ben Affleck Batman is. I think that could be really interesting. But a thought crossed my mind is, what if they went... And this is really off the wall, but what if they went a little Pulp Fiction-y with this? Mm -hmm. and, and a little bit of Twilight Zone with it. What if this movie is actually like three one-shot stories? Mm. And it, so the first story is Batman you know, uh, doing something with uh, Catwoman, and then it's like six months later. It's now it's Batman facing off against whatever, and then it's Batman. Mm. So it almost becomes a pulp series within a movie. I think that could be really interesting. I don't think that's what they're going to do. I don't. But if they wanted to be really off the wall, try something really different from and really change up the genre, that could be interesting, especially with them talking about having all these villains. I love it. I mean, there's a, there's a way that they could do that. I mean, movies do that all, all the time. They play with time. So you're talking about making it almost segmented pieces. Yeah, like three could, individual stories. Oh, a little Sin City-ish, if yeah. you will. It could be done or that like way. like Babel, but for yeah. Batman. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 What about you, Amy? Um, uh, those are all really interesting ideas. Uh, I'm leaning towards uh, one, of, one of the crime family type bad guys. Uh, because of what we've talked about with Ben Affleck's filmmaking background and and sort of like the town and, mm. and mm. this sort of like how good he is at like urban crime kind of scenarios um, and because I'm I'm hungry to see like the detective side of Batman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's why like Penguin or one of the crime families or something like that where he, you know, he's going to put on his Matches Malone persona and like go in right. there um, and try to figure that stuff out. I think that would be cool. Yeah, you know, that would I, be cool. I would love to see, uh, you know, I don't need to see uh, a Jim Carrey Riddler. I would like to see a crime. A crime Riddler yeah, a, would be cool. A, a boss mm. Riddler, like a gangster boss Riddler. So uh, I think whatever we're going to see, I'm really excited about it, but we're going to have to wait like two years. So we're not going to have to wait two years for The Punisher because he's coming to Netflix and it's probably <laughs> next year. They're rocking and rolling. They're like already shot Luke Cage. They're shooting Iron Fist right now. And Netflix has announced, yes, there's a Punisher. So after an incredible introduction in the second season of Daredevil on Netflix, the Punish Punisher played with incredibly nuanced portrayal by John John Bernthal. He's been given a full 
season green light. So Steve Lightfoot from Hannibal is going to be the series showrunner. Frank Castle will likely be seen in some of the upcoming series, like possibly The Defenders. He's going to show up in one of these other Netflix uh, series before he, before we actually see him in his own series. Let's talk, talk about the characters and story arcs we'd like to see in this new series of The Punisher. I'll lead it off and say one of my favorites was uh, Garth Ennis uh, when he did his run. I can't remember if it was like the maximum, you know, like the a, a bunch more of it was violent, max. violent one, but it was like I think she was an armless and legless, you know, kind of like crime boss who uh, right. he had, you know, gotten rid of her arms and legs previously, but she's still around and he's there to finish the job. And it was like ultra violence as only Garth Ennis could write. And those are the kind of stories that I I liked because it, it always had a little little hint of sarcasm and funny dark humor and that's the way Garth would write but Punisher was just so badass in those stories so that's what I'd like to see any any pop off to you well that's the run people come in for most mm, often okay. Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon uh in the Mac stuff it keeps right, going Steve in and Dillon. out of print um uh but I wanted to just reserve my my response to this one uh for a plug there's a new Punisher number one coming out in stores tomorrow really uh, and the artist is Steve Dillon. What? And the writer is Becky Cloonan. Who I has love a, Becky Cloonan. She has a, a super great, twisted imagination. Yes. Like she's an amazing artist in her own right. Um, she hasn't written The Punisher before, but I, I'm I'm very excited for that one. If you are in a Punisher mood, like all of us after watching this, Punisher number one tomorrow in shops. Let Dillon. me completely back her up with what I didn't even know about this until <laughs> this second. But those two talents, Becky Cloonan, who's an incredible artist in her own right and is a twisted individual. <laughs> she loves death metal. I I would say by anything that she draws or writes, coupled with Steve Dillon, that is some madness. I'm going to be at a comic book store tomorrow totally absorbing that Punisher number There's one. Declan Shalvey cover on it, which if you Google it, will blow so, your mind. Yeah, enough of this comic book yep, talk. Sorry, sorry, Even sorry. though this is a comic book show, <laughs> let's talk about what do you think about the Punisher? What series or I don't know. characters I mean, look, would you like I to loved, see? I loved, uh, look, the Mike Zeck series yeah, that I he drew. Yeah. I love that series. I would like to see the Punisher. I think this could be the one time they can get out of Hell's Kitchen. Mm. I'd love to see the Punisher go somewhere, like maybe hit the road, mm. like maybe go after vengeance that requires him to go to, I don't know, New Jersey, <laughs> maybe across the, the, the river to Park Slope, you know, go to Brooklyn or something. I mean, yeah. I just think that, look, I, I with Luke Cage, with Jessica Jones, with Daredevil, there's like a 13 block radius they're covering in sure. the show. I mean, I think it would be kind of nice to see the Punisher get where maybe some trees. Utah. Yeah, something, <laughs> something. Little park, little you know, park city. He's got to go clean up, uh, clean up the Mormons. Well, he's got a sniper rifle. He, he can, you know, take. Some but uh, out, you, you know, know, again, I don't know. I mean, welcome home, Frank. I, I always go back to that. Mm. But I do love that Mike Zek. That that was the first time I read Punisher. Sure, Same and that here. was the way he drew because because the the Steve Dillon Punisher was kind of thin. Whereas the Mike right. Zek Punisher Big. was huge and thick, and I I still somehow prefer the original Punisher and Spider Man, like as just the straight up villain. But then the Mike Zek ones are the ones that I came into. Right, so. right. A lot you, of people John? argue that that's the run that made him a, a going concern and not just a like guy who appeared in Spider Man was cool. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. The Mike Zek run is the one that Sorry. really put him on the map. I I think there's a couple of interesting things you could do here because first of all, I like I like to call myself out on this. I'm I'm one of the guys who I. I doubted John Bernthal's casting mm. as as Frank. I did. I, I doubted. I, I like him, but I didn't see it when they first cast him. Boy, did he change my <laughs> tune uh, because he's so good and I love him. And you know, I, I never had a chance to mention, but my absolute favorite Punisher moment in Daredevil season two, absolute favorite. Because sometimes he's going after a certain crime lord, and you're and you don't. Well, he is kind of being kind of brutal, but but the one time you're thinking, oh, dude, get him, was when he was in that pawn shop. And he's oh, walking yeah. out. He's like, hey, we want some, uh, some of that twist stuff. I got some young, like 12 years old. Uh -huh. Stops walking. <laughs> locks the door. He's like, get him! Yeah. He's just like, <laughs> so you're so excited about that. But here's, here's the one thing that I'm a, I'm a little bit not cautious about when it comes. One of the things that I think made Daredevil so good, uh, or uh, that made Punisher so good in Daredevil Season 2, was that we saw him as the, du the juxtaposition against Matt, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be interesting now to see how do we as an audience interact with him emotionally now without that Matt figure as the polar opposite to who he says he almost becomes defined by who Matt is much like Matt kind of defines himself by who the Punisher is in this thing but as far as where they could go with it um hey man this is a shared television Netflix universe right the scenes between him and freaking Kingpin I, if, if he goes off his own series, I'm ready to see Matt take a little bit of a break from Kingpin. And if they want to go on his own, have him mm. and Kingpin be his main adversary in it. 
I would be after seeing their scenes together, man. I'd yeah. be so down for that. I'm glad you brought that up. Very powerful <laughs> scenes. If you haven't had a chance to watch season two of Daredevil, do yourself a favor. It's a powerhouse season. Yeah. Incredible performances, especially by John Bernthal. Living representation of both Steve Dillon and John Romita Jr.'s version of the Punisher. Synthesis, such an incredible role. And he he basically embodied it in such an incredible way that he yeah. now has brought a, 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 his own series. So very I'm excited be, I, to see I didn't it. think I'd be happy about the announcement of a Punisher series when it was a rumor mm -hmm. before Daredevil season two. I was like, I don't know. Like, I want the focus on these other characters. But, like, again... I. Converted, completely yeah. right. converted. Yeah, yeah. Same for concerns sure. about how they're going to manage it, but I have faith. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely. But you guys both brought up really good concerns, but I'm ready to see how they, you know, so knock I. it out of the park if they do. So, uh, let's move on to Robert Downey Jr. and John Favreau returning to Marvel. This past week, we found out that John Favreau is interested in returning to Marvel as more than just an executive producer, which he's been on all the Avengers and and, and uh, skinny Favreau. Uh, yeah, that's via <laughs> thin Favreau, um, the non-bearded Favreau. And uh, we also hear that Robert Downey Jr. is now also very interested in doing an Iron Man four. Uh, does this sound like a re-team up is going to happen of the forefathers of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Is John Favreau going to possibly direct? Iron Man 4 with Robert Downey Jr. Is that magic going to happen? I feel that that is what they are starting to tinkle around with by dropping these little nuggets to us. What do y'all think? John, what do you think about this? Well, look, after Jungle Book, John Favreau can do whatever the F he wants at right. Disney. Disney will let him do whatever he wants to do. You want to do one of the Star Wars movies, John? Which I still believe is going to happen. Oh, I yeah. think you're going to see John Favreau do a Star Wars movie. But if he has any inclination, which I believe he does, because you're right, you're right. He's the godfather of this whole thing. This Marvel Cinematic Universe, we talk about Kevin Feige, and rightly so. He is the architect. He is mm -hmm. the mastermind. But this whole thing doesn't exist if it wasn't for John Favreau and what he did with Iron Man 1. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he pushed to have Robert Downey Jr. as that totally. guy. Um, so that's all there. Look, obviously, very uh, under the radar, because the story for a long time was, hey, you know... Robert Downey Jr. has only got one film left on his contract, or now two films left on his contract, can this blah, blah. Clearly, what has happened is Robert Downey Jr. did The Judge, it bombed, and he's like, you know what? I got a pretty damn good thing going with this Marvel Cinematic Universe. Sure, Kevin, sign me up. And now I think he's probably going to be in these movies now for the next 20 years. Mm. I think, because now he's talking, he's going to pop up in Spider-Man saying, yeah, I'll do Iron Man 4. He's, he's going to be in both the Infinity War movies. He's there for life. He is mm -hmm. going to be there forever. John Favreau, the moment he wants back in on this, you know he'll be back in on it. And there's no way we're not getting an Iron Man 4. Right. So absolutely, this is them only dropping the seeds of what is already a signed deal and a foregone conclusion and that we all already know. There's going to be an Iron Man 4. Now whether Iron Man 4 is going to be the one that Favreau actually directs or not, maybe he's just exec produces, maybe he, he directs Iron Man 5, another one. Who knows, but this is happening, no doubt about it. Wouldn't it be fun and happy for all of us at this table to see that happen, though? That's, I mean, so that's cool. Bringing it up just because they got to redeem themselves from Iron Man 2 I a little bit. I am 100% you know? with you. Yeah, they know that, hey, look, Iron Man 2 didn't shake out the yeah. way we wanted to. They've been on record saying it. A lot of things went down. That's why Favreau and and the rest of Mar the Marvel crew had a little bit of a fight, a little bit of falling out. Same could be said about Joss Whedon and Marvel. They had a little bit of a fight, a little bit of falling out. Yep. Everyone's going to make up and be friends. It takes a little while for that to happen. Look at Civil War. You'll see these things happen in real life too, <laughs> you know. So it's it's nice to hear that everyone is like kind of making up to uh, make some uh, cool magic happen. What do you think about this? No, I think it's great. I, I you know I thought what Favre did. No one believed Iron Man was going to work. No, I, mean, I know. People, <laughs> people, if you remember back when it was coming out, people were like Iron Man. What is like, that? How is that going to work? That's you know? a poor and, man's Batman. And, That's and all he is. Rich dude with did, toys. Oh, he did such a good job of nailing that tone. And I think, of course, after the Jungle Book, I mean, I think they're going to want him to do Jungle Book 2 maybe mm -hmm. first. But he was a producer. Favreau was a, still an exec producer on all, Age of Ultron. It's not yes. like he, he, he still appeared in Iron Man 3. He's an yeah. 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 EP so on he, all these films. Yeah, yeah, he's been around. And, and I think I'd love to see, why not, have him come back and do Iron Man 4. I mean, you know everybody wants an Iron Man 4. Mm -hmm. We all do, because we love that character. I mean, it's especially after this movie, I, I want to know where do you go with that? Yeah. Like, where does, where does Tony Stark, who... Well, let's just say his life isn't exactly where he wants it to be, I think. Even more so than at the end of Iron Man 3, his life is not so good. Right. And I want to see what he's going to do. Like, what if he does try and go on the straight and narrow? Can he give up the armor? I don't know. I want to see. Definitely. How about you, Amy? 
Uh, I got very excited about both of these rumors, although I figured my, my guess had been that they meant separate things, that we will get an Iron Man 4 and that Jon Favreau might come back and do some other character or other corner of the universe, although I don't know if they'd be able to resist, like, at least having a cameo in there and tying it in, mm -hmm. because that would just be fun. Uh, but if it is Favreau and, and Downey Jr. for Iron Man 4, sure, sign me up. Definitely. And by, by the way, I just want to point out, he's... Favreau in that picture there, rocking the Lucasfilm T-shirt. Just, yep. just throwing that out there. <laughs> I think he's going to be we're, we're rocking a Star Wars story yep. in the future. But um, you know what you said though. I think, I think Robert Downey Jr., especially after Civil War, as an actor, he's been given a lot to play. I yeah. think that one of the, one of the things that that look, all actors want one thing. They want great parts. Mm -hmm. And I think this movie especially gives. He's he was look if you go back and you look at him in like Chaplin, mm -hmm. Robert Downey Jr. was a fantastically talented actor. Got an Academy Award nomination for it, and he's he's not just playing a comic book character. This is a man. I mean, there are scenes he's playing scenes with. I don't want to ruin anything, but he's got very dramatic scenes in right. Civil War across the board. Yes, scenes of of domesticity, scenes of of strife between friends scenes of self-doubt, scenes of accusations. I mean, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things in this film where he's running the gamut. And for an actor, if he wasn't given anything to play, he might just be like, look, I'm, I'm getting the money, whatever. But he's being given a great part here. Yes. And, and he's doing great things with it. He's doing yeah. great things with it. And in this movie especially, I mean, no wonder he wants to come back. And he's very involved in the script. And he's like, hey, I'd say this. Or yeah. He's a very involved actor, when he, especially with these uh, the Iron Man and Avengers films. Um, so... I think it's a great idea, and it's the one, the only one that they're going to let a number ha hit again, like Iron Man Four. All the rest of them are all subtitled. I'm sure they'll say number four just because it's something. That's, you know, it's a point of pride. I think with Marvel, they're like, yeah, this is number four of Iron Man, the one that you never thought would hit it out of the park. So right. I would like to see these two guys team up, and of course, John Favreau is plays a role in Iron Man. He's yes, like, it would be Hogan. great to see him back. Yeah, Happy Hogan will be back. I'm sure. Um, let's talk about someone who's not coming back. It's the director of Seth, Seth Graham Smith. He has left The Flash, and it's looking for a brand new director. So Seth left due to creative differences, and now the search is on for a brand new Helmer. We've heard some rumblings about James Wan leaving, but then we saw that he tweeted a picture with him basically leaning against a wall of a giant uh, image of Aquaman. That was enough for him to be. He even said, look, everyone just chill. I'm trying to finish The Conjuring, relax with the weirdo rumors. I'm making Aquaman just lay off. Let me, you know, finish these spooky ghost movies before I go underwater for two years so we know james wan is sticking around for aquaman we're also hearing all these rumors about like back and forth between Zack snyder and wb that's just supposed that's just gonna happen i mean you have a movie that didn't perform the way they wanted there's you know there's gonna be hey maybe we should make it a little brighter maybe we shouldn't ha have so much murder who knows what they're talking about for just league but we do know that someone has to direct the flash I don't know who they're going to get. They got rid of the guy who wrote Dark Shadows and, uh, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. So um, now they got to get someone else. Who do you think they're going to get for The Flash, John? Oh, it could be anybody. I mean, we really don't know. But, but what is interesting to me, though, is whenever you hear of a situation like this where a studio, and it's, it's you know, it wasn't scheduling conflicts, straight up said. It's creative differences. Right. And But what's funny is that it seems like the, the fan sphere is always quick to go, then that means the studio's doing something bad if the direct not necessarily i right. mean look ultimately uh one of my favorite directors working today edgar wright and kevin feige separated over creative differences and guess what it worked out great and we're going to see wright do great movies that are outside the mcu and we got an amazing ant-man movie mm -hmm. out of it so just because the director didn't like that you kept having created that doesn't mean that the studio was wrong look we had Ava DuVernay was being offered Black Panther she had creative differences but after I saw what they were doing with the Black Panther and Civil War mm -hmm. stick with your plan right like if Ava DuVernay wanted to deviate from that plan then I can't wait to see her next movie whatever she's gonna do but I'm glad she's not doing back Black Panther yeah so what they're doing so just because he left over creative differences that does not necessarily mean ominous things for the flash happens to three more directors in a row that I'll come and go sure I mean, be different Happen with Thor Dark World too. Remember we had yes. Patty Jenkins, you know. So I mean, there's a, it happens all the time. Yes. So it's a, no, no reason to get weirded out by it. Also, he's a first time director. That's, right. I was thinking that. I mean, yeah. It, it's like, look, movies. Even if you're making a fifty thousand dollar, you know, low budget short in your grandparents' basement, it's still hard. 
making movies is not an easy thing to do. And if your first film, you've been a writer, you've been a novelist, a screenwriter, it doesn't mean you can jump on board a franchise property and make this into a film. This is not a slam dunk. You still have to, this is gonna take, plus you've got a TV series that's on too that you're competing against. So you're competing against your own character in another venue. Totally. This is not an easy job. And you ask like who, I think if he'd jump over, I think his light touch, Joe Johnston. Hmm. After what he oh, brought to what Captain, he did America, Captain America, yeah, and what he brought to the Rocketeer. Sure. I mean, maybe not. I don't know if they'd let him, but somebody like that, you know, somebody with that kind of sensibility, I think, would be beneficial. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's a, a list of different directors who would do an incredible job with the Flash. I think my concern is story-wise, what are they going to do mm. with the Flash? Because yeah. Something that they're doing so successfully well is something called The Flash, and it's on CW. <laughs> All right. So it's one of those things where it's, it's not some kind of bomb out, like, oh, that trash television show, let's do something good with a the movie. They've got an incredible series which is working on all cylinders, and they've already introduced us to other universes that The Flash has the ability to cross over into. So what better way to have Ezra Miller as The Flash be able to cross over into these other universes including the Flash universe that exists in whatever the CW universe is called. Well, they've already showed us in, in Batman v Superman that he has the ability to transverse time totally. and all that kind of stuff. So all those things could be on the I table. Would, I think that, but that, when you put that kind of game on the table, that makes a movie. That makes mm -hmm. like, you know, you have a crisis on Infinite Earths type of a thing. But for yeah. the Flash movie, you have to make it big. It's got to be a blockbuster. It's got to be a big reason to go see. We already have the Flash on television. You want to make a bigger reason to see yes. the movie yeah. Flash. So that's what that's my argument is like whether he left because of creative uh, differences, because whatever the script was or whatever people are trying to figure out. That's what I'm hoping is he left because maybe they're saying, look, we want to combine these universes. We want to make this bigger type thing. That's the only thing I could guess at. We're all going to guess and wonder about it until we get another director announced for The Flash. Until then, we're just going to have to wait and see. We're going to move on to the next uh, topic, and it's minor mutations. So every week we, uh, we bounce off, and I'm going to list off like eight different uh, uh, topics, and we are going to then uh, decide which ones we're going to talk about. And uh, starting off... With uh, number one, we've got Brian Singer. He defends the look of Apocalypse and also talked about the modulation of Isaac uh, of Oscar Isaac's voice. Uh, number two, we've got the Kree are arriving in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It doesn't look good for the planet Earth, I guess. Uh, number three, we've got Taylor Swift might be the Dazzler in a pic that was uh, you know, on Instagram from Sophie Turner, a picture of her holding a Dazzler album. You'll have to find that on Instagram. Look for it, Sophie Turner. She's on a little, fill, you know, series called Game of Thrones. Uh, number four, we've got Batman v Superman won't reach 900 million. It's still a hit for WB. It's the, the number seven biggest blockbuster superhero film uh, in the pantheon of superhero films. It's uh, at number seven right now. It's going to slowly probably edge up and, and get to about 900 million in the next couple weeks. Um, number five, we've got Finn Jones is doing his best Iron Fist while shooting. Look at that dude. It looks like he's in his pajamas rocking the Iron Fist. They're shooting in New York. Number six, we've got Jeremy Irons. He returns in the Justice League feature film as Alfred, helping out his pal Bruce Wayne to find the rest of the Justice League. Number seven, we've got Carl Urban mentioning conversations are happening for a dread series on either Netflix or Amazon. That is is something that's mega news okay uh number eight <laughs> I see what you did there. hey number eight we've got <laughs> will bruce wayne show up in wonder woman well she's in gotham in this picture getting into like a cab or station wagon with little wayne activity happening so uh very excited to see all this uh these pictures what pops off to you about the, any of these news items amy i mean i don't want to go straight for the x-men go but for it that like i don't know that the sophie turner tweet really means that Taylor Swift is making a cameo because to me like she's a young actress she may have just made that favorite album before 1989 joke because that's literally her favorite album mm -hmm. like on the other hand it could mean that but the the cool thing for those who saw the Bill Sienkiewicz special a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. is that they made a record which is a canonical Dazzler record with that exact art yep um you can find the side by sides if you go online like there was a cover of an issue of Dazzler where you see one of her records and it's that record and bless their hearts. That's super flavor. And you mentioned Bill Sienkiewicz. Happy 
birthday, Bill Sienkiewicz. Oh. Today is Bill Sienkiewicz's birthday, so happy birthday from all of us here at Collider Heroes. Robert, what pops off to you? Well, you know, I, I go back to the, because only because I've seen it, the apocalypse voice modulation thing. Mm. What's really interesting is, first of all, I loved Oscar Isaac's performance, but they did a really interesting, I don't, I wasn't there, but the way Brian explained it to me is that they actually had, they recorded his performance on stage, right. you know, obviously when they shot those production sound. Sure. But they augmented his voice in post by using these different mics and recording him in a way that he had to actually have his, he couldn't move his head. Like he had to lock it in place to do this performance. Weird. And they use his voice in very interesting ways. Sometimes he's very quiet or sometimes he's not, you know, and they mm. do different things. And it's, it's really... I loved Apocalypse in this movie. I just loved his character, and I loved I love Oscar Isaac. He can do no wrong. Hey, the most violent year. Now that you've seen both Civil War and X Men Apocalypse, in a comparison, which one edges out for you? Well, you know what? Okay, this is I've talked a lot about this, and the X Men universe. Brian Singer's. I'm going to say Brian Singer's X Men universe now because he's directed four of these movies. Sure. Is very much an auteurist thing, and it's very much concerned with things that Brian personally is concerned with, but if this makes any sense at all, the X-Men movies are much more fanciful. Mm -hmm. I mean, this coming from a guy who loves Guardians of the Galaxy and loves Thor, but the the mutant movies are much more of a pulp sci-fi sensibility, if that makes any sense, whereas the Marvel Cinematic Universe takes place in the real world. Right. <laughs> you know, I know that's absurd to sure. say, but the the... The the things I don't think it's 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 not there is a scene in ancient Egypt we've seen it in the trailers, I mean this scene in ancient Egypt is right out of a pulp you would never see I don't think you would see the scene in ancient Egypt in the Marvel Cinematic Universe hey maybe you would, but it's a different it's apples and oranges to me, and the same way that I can love you know what I would I I would equate it with Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek okay hmm. the Brian Singer's X Men movies are Star Trek even though they're not but they. But the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Battlestar Galactica because there are no aliens in Battlestar Galactica. It's, it's, it, you're dealing with human realities and it's much more along the lines of things that are happening in our time sure. today. Whereas the X-Men are, but it's clearly a much more colorful, well, I shouldn't even say that. It's such fantasy a Fantasy or science, yeah, it's science fiction fantasy. fantasy yeah. but it's heightened, science fiction no. fantasy, it's heightened, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a weird thing, but I enjoy both equally. I think I think Civil War it has a lot more to say about our world now totally. and the political structure that's going on on our planet today, whereas the X Men movies are dealing with alienation and, and people on a much larger level. Mm -hmm. I mean, a much more universal level, but also like the kid in me. I don't know. It's so weird, dude. It's just a weird thing. I don't know what I'm saying. They're different, mm -hmm. and I I love them equally. I think that uh, I think my mom would go and get more out of Civil War than she would out of X Men, um, only because she, my mother, is very pragmatic and is not as imaginative as say I am. Whereas I think when Psylocke shows up with her Soul Sword or whatever, my mom's like, "What is that? What's going on?" Where she would understand Captain America and Iron Man. Sure, this is more that real makes world. Any sense. I get it. Uh, you know, the thing that sticks out to me is uh, I'm glad you I, I, I feel like I understand a little bit more about the X-Men Apocalypse film. Hopefully we'll be seeing it very soon and we'll be doing a spoilers thing. But, you know, it comes out in a couple weeks. Uh, for me, it's Carl Urban and announcing that Dread series because, <laughs> man, did everyone miss the boat if you didn't see Judge Dread in 3D in the theaters because that was some of the best use of slow motion, freak out, amazing cinematography in 3D. What an amazing film. But what was more amazing about it is they absolutely nailed Mega City. They nailed Judge Dredd, and Carl Urban is Judge Dredd. I'm glad he hasn't put out the fire, or the flame, or whatever it is that they need to get that made. If they're not going to make it as a movie, I want to see it. It's even better as a series, and I would love to see it on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or any of these new SVOD streaming situations you can make 10 episodes you could rock that it'll amortize its own costs whoever producers out there get that money together make judge dread make dread whatever you need to call it get carl urban signed on that is a series waiting to happen well you know there's a movie that came out that's uh it's called high rise 
Oh, I cannot and, wait to see that. And I loved it because it's based on a J.G. Ballard sure. novel, and Ballard mm. wrote Crash that Cronenberg... Of course. Well, he wrote the novel that Crash was based on. He also wrote the novel that Empire of the Sun, that's the Steven Spielberg movie, mm -hmm. was based on. Jeremy Irons. I love Jeremy Irons. He's one of my favorite actors. Sure. When he was in Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, it's one of the great performances by any actor playing two people ever. Um, but he's crazy in High Rise, which is kind of like Mega City. Oh so yeah, no, I cannot that. wait to see High Rise. But so that comes I, out this week. I loved him, and I think that I want to see more of his Alfred. That relationship that he had with that. Batman yeah. was one of the highlights of Batman v Superman. I, I loved agree. what they had Easily. going on there. Yeah. So bring him on. And by the way, watch High Rise. Yeah, High Rise. It's on VOD coming out in the next week. Um, and Loki is in it. Tom Hiddleston. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, what is it? Jeremy Irons, amazing actor. Yeah, that to me was some of the standout performance work, not only from Ben Affleck, Gal Gadot, but. Jeremy Irons as Alfred and as a kind of a war hero, war veteran who helps right. Batman on his missions. I like that aspect, especially with Jeremy Irons playing that character. All right, this week's flashback is Avengers Age of Ultron. That's right. The sequel to the Avengers came smashing to us in 2015 with more Avengers introduced like the Vision, Scarlet Witch, War Machine, and the Falcon, and for a few minutes, Quicksilver. We now have the return of the original Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk, Black Widow, and Hawkeye. We even got Nick Fury and Maria Hill back as well. And we had the introduction to several new villains like Ulysses Claw, and we got the big bad Ultron voice with an ominous yet silken evil by James Spader. This movie was written and directed by the super talent Joss Whedon, who made the first of Avengers film, as well as many incredible TV series like Buffy, Angel, and Firefly. This movie was big, dense, and chock full of action. It moved a lot of plot points forward with a bigger story phase regarding Thanos and concentrated on developing the story of whether the Avengers should be in control of the safety of the world. Let's, let's talk about the middle act of the trilogy that began with Captain America Winter Soldier and ends with Captain America Civil War. This is the middle nugget called Avengers Age of Ultron. Let's talk about Avengers Age of Ultron. So this is the, the you know the sequel to the granddaddy of them all, the Avengers. And something that none of us really at this table ever thought we'd see in our lifetime was a, an incredible superhero action team featuring Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, and the Hulk. People would be like, are you crazy? If you talk to me like 15, even 10 years ago, I'd be like, ah, it'll never happen. That's impossible. And now we've got multiple episodes of the Avengers. Even Captain America Civil War, you can call a mini Avengers film because everyone's in it and it involves the Avengers. So let's talk about this Age of Ultron. What were your thoughts about it, Robert? I loved it. You know, I, I mean, I... I, it, it, the only thing that I didn't love about this movie is that one of my favorite things in any comic book ever is in Avengers 22, mm -hmm. the George Perez, Kurt Busiek version, when they finally fight their way after Ultron's murdered millions of people, they fight their way into a stronghold, they knock down the door and there's the Avengers beaten bloody. It's a famous panel, look it up. Ultron, we would have words with thee. I wanted that. Mm -hmm. I just didn't get that. I loved everything else about this movie. I don't know why people say, oh, it sucked. It's How did it suck? That opening <laughs> scene when they're attacking that stronghold right. and you see that they're all fighting, it's all one shot, and they all come and they all leap together in slow motion. James Spader, always a favorite actor of mine, all the way back to Tough Turf in 1985. Mm -hmm. Go look that up. Robert Downey Jr. and James Spader together in a movie with Kim Richards, one of the housewives of Beverly Hills. Right. Jack Mack and the Heart Attack. But I love this film, and I, I think that, look, as we talked about, the Avengers party scene when they're all trying to lift Thor's hammer. Oh, yeah. Sure. The introduction of Vision, which is so well handled. There's so much in this movie to delight in mm -hmm. all the way through, even to the very end when, when the final confrontation between the Vision and Ultron, well, I was born yesterday. Sure. It was such That's a great conclusion. Poetic. Now, was he a world-dominating, world-destroying villain? Maybe Ultron didn't do what we wanted him to do, but how could he in in the space of one movie? Right. I still loved it all. I did love the underlying undercurrents of the film, and I think it stands right in, alongside to the Avengers, and it leads into this movie beautifully. As a matter of fact, Age of Ultron becomes a better movie with Civil War. Most definitely. Amy, what are your thoughts on Age of Ultron? Uh, so I, I was sort of on the fence. I liked it a lot better the second time. Uh, I've seen and heard a lot of criticisms that I can't necessarily disagree with. I still, I love the movie. Uh, the moments, especially some of the ones you just called out, it is uh, full of moments that mm -hmm. I adore and characters that I adore and interactions I adore. There are larger questions where, like, overall, like, you know, if I were running this show, did it, it it's a little bit soon in your second Avengers movie that everybody's kind of tired of being the Avengers. Right. But they played out that theme really beautifully. 
Um, and they had a lot of wonderful moments. I I was I was a skeptic about like I I the the Black Widow romance storyline didn't work for me as well as mm -hmm. I would like for it to have. Even right. though they all they did they played that out very beautifully. It just so so mixed feelings, but like I still enjoy it and I love it as a part of the larger Marvel universe. It just it wasn't the same. Everything about this is perfect as the first Avengers movie, but I don't know if that was ever going to happen. I'll say this about the Avengers: Age of Ultron. I think it's very uneven, uh, fun film, but there's a lot of hits and misses for me. Like I found the little button tags of comedy, like you know, language or oh my legs hurt. Like little those little moments before a scene ends where there'd be like this little humor line cut in. I became tired of it, and that huh. was like the first 30 minutes, and oh, I love hap those. it happened. But it, to me, it wasn't organic. Like for me, Winter Soldier and Civil War has that, those organic comedy moments. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and Avengers has it, but this Age of Ultron, it felt like it was a button. Like it was, like, it was to me, popping out. Mm -hmm. So, well, and, um, and, and like Quicksilver, I, I, I loved their story. Like the final Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch in the shed on top of floating Sokovia. Right. Like that's a moment that's going to sti stick with me for years and years. So sure. And that was a human moment because he was like, I don't even belong here. I'm fighting robots and this and that. No, some of the dialogue was amazing. I just also felt like I felt Ultron was rushed. Hmm. I felt like the, the birth of Ultron. Uh, I saw these trailers for Age of Ultron and I could not wait to see this character brought to life the, from the comic books that I've read. And I felt it was just so rushed with Baron Strucker and the armor, and then literally he's an orb talking, and then bam, he's Ultron, he's cracking jokes. And that was like in 25 minutes. So for myself, the storyline of Ultron, if they developed it a little bit more, I myself personally would have liked it more because I felt like they just got to the villain too quick and he's cracking jokes and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm the persona of Iron Man and Jarvis. And it was just, there was just too much that happened too quickly. And then once again, the law of diminishing returns happens, which is one of the things you won't see in some of these futuristic, uh, these, I'm sorry, these future superhero films is like, oh, it's the Avengers fighting an army of something that we just have to get to this one button to turn them all off. It's in a, it's, there's no, there's nothing riding on it. There's a, oh, they're fighting a bunch of Chitari, and now they're fighting a bunch of robots, and now they're fighting a bunch of, it's just a bunch of insects or ants that you have to get to the mother hive to turn it off. So it just feels like it's, it's more of the same. So I hate to even say that, because the action scenes are great. I love the introduction of the vision. So for me, when I first saw it, and that's what happens. Sometimes you'll see a film, and if you're you know reviewing it for other people, if you see it right away and review it right away, you might come away, like what happens with me, I'll see a movie and then 20 minutes later, I'm in front of a camera like, well, I like this part and I like that. You haven't had enough time to process it. So for myself, I saw Age of Ultron and gave it um, a very high number. The following day, I was like reflecting on, I was like, I don't know if I would give it that high of a number right now. So nowadays I try to see a film and wait a full day so I could really think and, and soak in it myself before I give my full opinion because I ended up, you know, I thought about it. So it's not that I liked it any less, but it was like, I would say, you know, there's these moments that didn't work for me. And, you know, there's certain things like that. I, I could argue with both of you. You might have liked the farm sequence. I did not like the farm sequence. Mm -hmm. I thought they were on that farm way too long. It became drawn out. It felt like, it really felt like, oh, Joss Whedon felt bad for Hawkeye. So he's giving him this extra scene because in the first movie he was a zombie. And <laughs> well, I was like, look, I don't care about that. Just make him organically work and you don't have to add this extra. Like, I did love minutes. that as the tease for who might die in the movie. I assume this is a spoiler okay kind yes. of scenario because the movie came if out. You if you seen haven't seen Avengers, it, Avengers please, Age of Ultron, watching stop this. watching this. Uh, but like as the uh, building into the like it looks like Hawkeye's probably going to bite it, like meeting someone's family is usually a really great sign sure. that you're about to get your heart pulled out. And I so I, I thought that was kind of cool. You know, I, I don't disagree with anything that you said, but I also would be remiss if I did not mention, mm -hmm. and I feel I have to mention, that what could possibly be the greatest hot toy of all time, <laughs> the Hulkbuster. Oh, sure. <laughs> the Hulkbuster was introduced in yeah. this, and, and that was, talk about special sauce and special flavor. I mean, I, <laughs> as, a, as a, I sat there like, like giddy, just as a little kid, I couldn't believe when, you know, he's got Veronica, or what is it, Betty, sure. Veronica, you know, coming <laughs> over, and, and then the Hulkbuster forms around his Iron Man armor. I lost my, my noodle sure. then. I, I mean, that was, that, that was so gratifying. It's not quite the heights of the airport scene, which is one of the greatest right. things I ever in Civil War. But this, that fight sequence with the Hulk, 
come on. Hey, it was I mean, amazing. That was, I, I'm, that was Avengers special I, sauce right yeah, there. I really enjoyed the Avengers Age of Ultron, but it didn't reach the heights of Avengers for me. Like for me, seeing the Avengers and that formation of that team, even seeing like just Thor fighting Hulk on the helicarrier, just certain right. things like that, that. But you didn't feel like in the, that helicarrier scene goes on a long time mm -hmm. when the helicarriers, they have to get it flying in. And the, the whole opening is a little stilted. You know, when they've got the scepter and Loki shows sure, up. Sure, but it, it works for me better than this this movie. But do you think that's because it was novelty? It was new? You hadn't Definitely, seen it before? Yes. I 100% agree I don't think that. That's a, the whole thing, though. I, I Like, that no. element is certainly at work. The, there is the, like, they hit it out of the park on the first one. So, yes, it was going to be tough to ever match it because it would never be new again. But I'm, I'm still, like, that's not a complete explanation for the. the no, I think the real that. problem right. is ultimately Ultron doesn't do much. He, my problem with Ultron is be he is a cartoon of himself before we're even allowed to enjoy him as a version right. of himself. Be, he's a mockery of what he is. You know what I mean? He's making fun. He's cracking jokes. He's doing. Hmm. He's just too one dimensional. No, I mean in I the wanted comics, to care about him. He murdered people, and there's been so many different iterations of Ultron over the years. Yeah, Ultron is a really dangerous character. And as much as I love James Spader, I'll say that, you know, once James Spader is talking like Ultron, it's like he's not that bad. Like Ultron's kind of, he's kind of chill, you know. He has, I mean, I just felt like they added those little, you know, quirky jokes just way too early to let, just establish him as like, what is, why is he on the planet? Why does he want right. to live? He was like, obviously he eats Jarvis and there's a nugget of Jarvis left over to like get into the vision. But I mean, I me, personally, I felt the vision was handled perfectly. Yeah. So Ugh. there's certain sequences in the entire film where I'm like, wow, they really got the, they, I'm so happy they got Paul Bettany to play the Vision. Yes. I thought all the so scenes good. With I mean, the Vision I'm really were great. tired of age gaps, but this is one of those like this one uh, is fine. Just work on your shit in other areas, people. That's right. <laughs> well, his voice, yeah, Paul Bettany's voice. I, you know, I was always the, my worry in the film when I went in. I'm like, what is the Vision going to sound like? Mm -hmm. Because of uh, you know, I've got so many years of reading the Vision. Of course, he's one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. I mean, I remember being a kid. Who's more powerful, the Vision or the Silver Surfer? Right. You know, and then we bring in the Hulk. I mean, who are you going to... Right. But the Vision was, once you hear him speak, I mean, you think Jarvis's voice, but no, it's different. Once the Vision starts talking, once you see... And the best character design ever. Oh, yeah, they did a great that job. That character is beautifully done. Well, and, and it had, the movie had hard work to do in that, like, the first Avengers had to unite everyone, but Avengers Age of Ultron had to sell us on a comic book universe that has people like Ultron and the Vision in it. Right. And they didn't give us, like, a black leather Vision. Right. They gave us a colorful Vision. Uh, right. And, like, that was that was a big thing for me, which was, we talk about it all the time, but things that you just don't think anyone will ever have enough confidence and skill to bring to life in a live-action film. And that Vision was at the top of that heap, and Paul Bettany's right. one of my favorite Red actors of all face, time. Red face, green outfit, yeah. yellow cape. I mean, you're sort of like, they'll never do that. And they were able to make it work, and it looks cool. So, I mean, hats off to Joss Whedon. I know that was, like, a, a crushing film to work on. It was, like, a nonstop schedule, it's juggling and writing and directing and, and producing and you know, having all these different characters that had so many different characters to service as well as get this, uh, you know, villain in there. So it's definitely a really a fun, awesome film in the, in the Marvel catalog. You know, I, what, any closing thoughts on Age of Ultron? Sorry, I just remembered the part where Vision has the hammer. That's, that's the closing right. thoughts. I just keep remembering things I love about yeah. this movie. No, that's a great uh, so you, got, you know, that's the thing. I think it's interesting about this movie. You love it while you're there, throughout the movie, but as a full, fully realized film, right. it doesn't give you the impact. Like when you're watching it, there's all these different scenes that are great, right. but it doesn't resonate after it's over. Mm. Uh, you know what I love? I love thinking about as the middle of the trilogy of Captain America: Winter Soldier, then see Age of Ultron, then see Civil War, and it really works a lot better. I'd so. I should rewatch it with that yeah. order. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on. Uh, that's it for Age of Ultron. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen Captain America: Winter Soldier. Watch that, then see Age of Ultron and then check out Civil War this Friday. Uh, we're going to move on to, on to Twitter questions. We're skipping Spotlight this week. Um, Twitter questions, starting out with Geeks and Goddesses. Are there any public domain superheroes you know of that would be made into a new comic book, TV show, or film? So public domain characters. The one that just pops into my head would be a really weird one. It is the very first newspaper kid, the yellow kid. <laughs> the very first 
serialized cartoon character ever. It's this weird little dopey bald kid with a yellow drapey outfit. I would love to see someone make a weird cartoon or even a sitcom just called The Yellow Kid. That's we could do some weird combo animation other thing because he doesn't really talk, but does his shirt change? Am I remembering that right? Or is it always got like the A on it? Or I, you could some kind of heightened reality thing. I think a heightened reality, like. yeah. Like maybe it's a dude who then has weird dreams of himself as the yellow kid, <laughs> or the yellow kids like existing in modern, in the modern real live action world. It would just be weird. Any public domain characters pop off to you? <laughs> I was thinking Steve Canyon, who's a strip character, but I'm sure he's not in the public domain. I don't know the spirit, the shadow. They did the spirit, the shadow. The yeah, those shadow aren't. Shaking. They're not in public domain. Yeah, I mean, I can't even. go You know back what is though? Let's what? let's let's get Dracula and Va and Frankenstein to fight each other as superheroes. <laughs> or Doc but Savage. There's, there's a wealth. Yeah, of he's, yeah. he's not in public domain. He's not. Nope. Really? Frankenstein and Dracula are public domain. You can turn them into weirdo superheroes and have them. You can make a monster superhero team out of those weirdo characters. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, public domain. That would have to go back and do some research. There's a, actually a woman named Hope Nicholson uh, who is a comic book editor and creator and has been doing a ton of research lately into old titles that I'd forgotten about. And she's been rediscovering all these like uh, Dale Arden and the the like female flight force from oh, nice. like the, I can't remember, it's not <laughs> female Flash flight force. Gordon. <laughs> but it's it's these wonderful old like strips uh, that, and if you find her on Twitter, like she's been spotlighting all of the like, there's a huge range of goofy golden age or legitimately amazing golden wow. age characters that like, the only difference between them and Batman is that we've accepted Batman and people came along and did great right. work with them. And it doesn't mean sure. there aren't, there isn't that kind of potential with like, the the early like jungle goddess characters or like the there's this the Canadian proto Wonder Woman character uh, who I think would be Nelvana of the Northern Lights am I thinking of the right thing? It's a good title. But there's just tons of these like you find them in these like comedy rundowns, but there's it's because there were hundreds of different characters right. in books that you can dig back up. I think the author Salad and Ahmed also also will uh, occasionally on his Twitter spotlight some like crazy old Golden Age thing from an anthology. I will of check lost those characters. out. What's her name again? Nickel? Hope Nicholson. Hope Nicholson. I'll definitely check that out. Um, next question is Brandon Granzo asks, how should WB reflect on the fact that Batman v Superman did not beat Deadpool's domestic box office? Huh. Well, you know, I mean, you know, in this, uh, you know, yardstick measuring game, um, I think, you know, WB is like doing their best to start a superhero universe. I mean, they're like a little bit behind. Um, with Marvel and DC, as well as just a bunch of other, uh, you know, properties. They're doing great on television. They've got an entire universe that they've built on television. They've got Arrow, they've got The Flash, they've got Supergirl. So I think in their, in their uh, you know, movie universe, they've got Superman v. Bat, Batman v. Superman, and, you know, that didn't hit it off and didn't hit the public like Deadpool did. Yet yeah, Deadpool's an R-rated film, but it made more money. It's because people really you know, wanted to see Deadpool and it hit a button that no one had hit yet. So I think, you know, with these future films, you've got Just Lee, you've got Flash, you've got Aquaman, you've got Wonder Woman, you've got the Batman, and coming up next, Suicide Squad. I think Suicide Squad is going to be a massive hit. I think it's it's really everything we've seen has enticed us ever since that very first Comic-Con trailer got released. We were like, oh my God, that looks really, really exciting and different. And I think as long as they play that to that market where you're like showing us something we haven't seen yet, I think they're going to have hits. What do you think? Well, domestic box office is no longer the yardstick by which any film is measured. I mean, every franchise makes a lot more money foreign mm -hmm. now. The James Bond franchise makes a lot more money for it. I mean, Spectre was the second highest grossing James Bond film after Skyfall, and it made most of its money f in foreign markets. The Fast and Furious franchise. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, I mean, people are now, Batman v Superman's made $850 million. Last I checked, it was the 47th most successful film of all time. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a very respectable number. Totally. The idea that your first cinematic universe movie, whether it was Man of Steel or this, deserves to make Avengers numbers. Right. No, no, you've got to build. You got to build, son. You got to make yeah. that movie yeah, work Yeah, remember, for you. Avengers was built off of four other films: Iron Man, Hulk, Captain America, and Thor. And then you got Avengers. This is built off of like a man of steel. I think what so. Batman v Superman's done is going to make sure that Wonder Woman is going to be a huge yes, huge film. Well, yeah. and I think that actually might be if there's a way to implement the lessons of of Deadpool, which like I it you could say it's a forced comparison because they vary. They're such different movies with such 
different missions. But what you said that find out, figure out what your film does that's different that people haven't seen before, mm -hmm. that is a tremendous factor in the corner of the Wonder Woman people if they do it right and if they like they have an opportunity to be like, look, first out the gate with the marquee female hero with 75 years of history. No one else has that. Right. No one else has one of those sitting around. Nope. Um, and you have a tremendous opportunity to say, here's what you haven't seen before. Then hopefully they're going to deliver it. I'm, I can't wait to see Wonder Woman. Uh, next question is Chris Jones asks, what do you think if back when Wesley Snipes talked to Marvel about a year ago, it was about reprising his role as Blade in Infinity War? Well, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, if anything, I would guess that they were talking to Wesley Snipes perhaps about a Blade series for Netflix and, you know, maybe having a younger female type Blade character and him taking on the, uh, what was his name? Whisper or Whitler? I can't remember the, the character. Whit Whistler. 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 It was Whistler. Yeah. Sorry. Couldn't remember. But what do you think? Bl Wesley Snipes, Blade, what's going on? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think if you're going to have a Blade character, again, you've got you've to remember Robert Downey Jr. has been Iron Man for now eight years. Yeah. And, and Hugh Jackman's been playing Wolverine for 17 years. Or will be playing yeah. Wolverine for 17 years. And Good it's God. like, you've got to have people that are going to age. The only reason that Hugh Jackman doesn't want to play Wolverine anymore is he's getting old and doesn't want to do those workouts. Sure. And they're, they're killer. And you've got to have people that can age into their roles because totally. now you're locking people in for 10 years or so. I mean, right. Wesley Snipes, I don't know how old he is. What, it'll be 60? Sure. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it was. He want, I'm sure he'd love to be Blade. But they've got to get a younger Blade. I'd have him as Blade Whistler, you know, sitting down and talking to Mad Smash. I like your idea, though. It would be cool. And I'm not really sure how Blade fits into Infinity War. Right. Like, that would, it does seem like it'd be a closer fit tone and content wise for, like, the, the Netflix version of the Marvel Universe. Um, but again, the, the comics are supposed to be introducing a younger female Blade. Uh, the book got shelved. Uh, and I don't know if it's coming this summer or if something just fell apart behind the scenes, but they may already be thinking that. Yeah, let sure. me yeah. ask It'll be coming once they announce the Netflix series. Bro. Can yeah. I ask you guys, both of you, this is an important question I've asked myself mm -hmm. for a long time. If a vampire is taken away from our yellow sun and you go into a different star system, is it kind of like the opposite of Superman? So could a vampire be in a different kind of sunlight? Because a vampire is intrinsic to the earth. Mm -hmm. So if you moved a vampire like out, I know he's a day walker, mm -hmm. but let's say you took, say Morbius, right. the living vampire, if you took him to the Infinity War and brought him out, have the Guardians of the Galaxy pick him up and take him to a different star system, could a vampire exist in sunlight? I want to say that he grows like to the size of Giant Man <laughs> for, you know, just he expands. I would love uh, I, I love the idea that they use in a, a Vertigo book called American Vampire by Scott Snyder right uh, oh, sure. that and and one of the premises of that series is that it sort of begins in the old West with some flashbacks and then like the 1920s and one of the key ideas was that our ideas about vampires are drawn from old world Europe and there's no reason like those are just old world Europe vampires. Mm -hmm. The properties of the monster emerge sort of in this relationship with place, mm -hmm. um, which means that American vampires are going to be something different. Totally. And that would be something very fun to see if you did cosmic vampire stuff. What are the natural properties that emerge from that planet? What's its version of vampires? Sure. What does it share with ours and what doesn't it? I like that I love idea. that. That's a Mario great answer. Baba's Planet of the Vampires might tell you. Yeah, if you haven't seen that freaky weird film, check it out, Planet of the Vampires. Billy J. Szyzlinski asks, if the real Hugh Jackman really is passing on the Wolverine torch, what about a son like Dakin instead of a reboot? <coughs> X-23. Yeah, I <coughs> X-23 as well. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. I mean, why not? Um, it's a natural, you believe it, if they establish that within continuity. Um, I, I heard a few things about the, the, the new Wolverine movie. Mm -hmm. I might have heard a few things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's that's a way to go. Hey, I like I like when Robert hears a few things. Duncan can still be in it, but he'd be he'd be like antihero style, defying mm -hmm. yourself against it. Right, like the exactly. next generation at odds over right. the meaning of it. Like uh, yeah. I like all of it. And this. and you know, there's a very interesting question that might arise in some people's minds. You're killing me. <laughs> Uh, that has something to do with... I, you know what? People should just stay through the credits of X-Men Apocalypse. Mm. Uh, That's all I'm saying. There we go. You heard it first right here. Sit around, watch those 10 minutes of credits, because there might be something popping up at the end. Sweaty question of the week comes to, from, uh, to us from Coach MV 45 asking, I am a huge fan, and I love Collider Heroes. Well, thank you. We love making the show. Would it be possible to have Stan Lee 
guests appear on the show. Well, Stan Lee, if you're watching Collider Heroes, and I know you watch us every week, um, please come on the show and do a special cameo. We'd love to have you. Um, we would love to have Stan Lee, and uh, we're going to make it happen, not just for you, Coach, but for every single one of our Collider Heroes. I would also like to point out that the Stan Lee Hot Toys figure dropped this week in Hong Kong. Really? So it'll be here in about a month. Up? There so is a Hot Toys Stan Lee figure. Hang on a second. Are you trying to tell me that there is a Hot Toy Stan Lee figure that's going to come out here in the United States next month? In a, it'll take about a month to be shipped over. It's in Hong Kong now. Hmm. <laughs> but you can, yes, Hot Toys made it. Perhaps that we, Stan Lee we might be able to get Stan Lee to promote his own Hot Toys figure here on Collider Heroes. Good idea, Robert. You don't need Meyer me to Burnett. be able to talk during that, right? SideshowToy.com <laughs> will have the Stan Lee Hot Toys figure. And it's actually it's a great figure. Well, as long as he comes with all the different outfits from all of his appearances from the Marvel films, I'll buy it. I'll, maybe I'll get it anyway. Hey, guys, thanks for tuning in to a special episode of Collider Heroes number 56. We're done talking. We'll see you next week. Robert Meyer Burnett, where can we find you online? As always, on Instagram at RM Burnett or Twitter, Burnett RM, or on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. And Amy Dallin, where can we find you online? Oh, thank you for having me back. I am on Twitter at EnthusiAmy. I'm on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Amy Dallin, where I have a show called Future Girl. And I'm over at Geek and Sundry on Drama Club Heroes. And and you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And I wanted to plug my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Uh, we've got it over in uh, Rio de Janeiro, playing uh, from May 10th to the 22nd. It's at a film festival called The Quaxo, so you could look that up. Or just check out the RioTimes.com or any of the Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So if you're in Rio, check out the film. And we've also got it playing in Glasgow, Scotland, um, on May 9th at 7.30. It's part of the Restless Natives Festival. Um, we're going to, me and Holly Payne, the producer, are going to do a Skyped in a QA uh, after the screening. It's going to be at St. Luke's in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, go to the website, restlessnativesfestival.org, to get your tickets if you happen to be in Scotland. So, Rio, Glasgow, what's up? And uh, I'll see you here next week on Collider Heroes. Thanks. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.